This story happened to me on a Thursday night when I was home alone in my apartment complex. I live with my roommate Josh, who was usually out with his girlfriend, so that gave me the luxury of having the place to myself. I was video chatting with three classmates of mine on Facebook Messenger. Their names were Eric, Craig, and Cindy. This was my first interaction with them as our professor selected us to be in a group project together. Throughout the night, we brainstormed ideas while getting more acquainted with one another. This is when the story gets a bit weird. Eric spontaneously asked the group chat, Hey guys, want to see something cool? What is it? Getting an A-plus in this project would be cool. Sure man, what's up? Eric sends the group chat a photo. I click the chat icon and see a disturbing image of a woman with her arms and legs missing. What the hell? Ew! Why are you sending us this? Dude, where the hell did you get that photo? I'll tell you, but you guys really need to keep this a secret. Promise me you won't tell anyone. Um, this isn't marketing related, but okay, I guess. Uh, sure, dude. Please don't tell me you were the sicko who took that pic. I didn't. I actually got the photo from the dark web. Dude, you go on the dark web? What's the dark web? Supposedly, it's this hidden part of the internet where you can buy illegal stuff. I personally wasn't that educated about the dark web, but I did hear rumors about it growing up. I've always acknowledged the existence of these kinds of things growing up, but I was still unaware as to what potential atrocities lie within the online world. Eric then says, Yeah, I just recently started getting into it. I found the photo from one of the forums I came across called Homemade Dolls. Here's the full-size picture. He then sends us the exact same photo, except this time it had a description box next to it with the title, Doll Number 20. Why the hell of all people did I have to be in a group project with this weirdo? The details in the description stated inhumane acts that can be performed on the victims before being shipped to their buyers. I felt pretty disgusted reading the dialogue, but I was still somewhat skeptical about the whole thing. It was hard to deny its legitimacy though. The authenticity of the image looked too real to be a hoax. To be honest, this looks photoshopped. I don't know, it looks pretty real to me. Dude, that's disgusting. Why do you even go on sites like that? Well, I only go on it occasion- Midway through Eric's sentence, a random user joins the video chat. Uh, who's that? I don't know. I swear to god, we better not be getting hacked. Eric, is this one of your stupid friends from the dark web? I'm gonna call the cops if it is. That's when I decide to move my mouse cursor to exit the video chat. Why the hell isn't this working? Come on, work goddammit! My cursor was resisting to move no matter how many times I clicked or moved my mouse. That's when the random user's video turned on. It was a guy wearing a pig mask. The mask didn't look like some dollar store knockoff. It looked like the skinned face of an actual pig. He wore it like he was Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hey, uh, is anybody seeing what I'm seeing? Eric, dude, I really hope this isn't a stupid prank. It's not, dude. I don't even know who that is. Why is there a guy wearing a pig mask on my screen? Guys, what's going on? I, I don't know why, but... Something about that moment. I just knew. I was looking into the eyes of what true evil looks like. That's when my classmate's video chat completely froze. The only screen functioning was the pig man's. It seemed like our computers were being hijacked. I couldn't quite comprehend what was going on until I heard the pig man say, Can you see me? Say yes if you can hear me. Say it! I reply with, Yes, what, what do you want from me? In an uncontrollable stutter. You know that feeling you get when you're with someone for so long? Every single day just drags and becomes a routine. Well, I just want something new and fresh, you know? Something vibrant that will make me feel alive again. I just... I just need a new doll! <laughs> what do you say? Does it sound like a brilliant plan to you? <laughs> I was completely appalled by what was transpiring. That's when I hear a muffled female's voice in the background. The pig man then swivels the camera towards the direction of the muffled voice, only to reveal a woman with no arms and legs. She had duct tape on her mouth and a chain bound around her neck. The woman was flailing her severed arms wildly in a desperate attempt to escape. 
A couple seconds later, the pig man approaches her while holding an axe, the kind of axe lumberjacks use to chop down trees. I began to hyperventilate as I knew the inevitable fate this woman was about to endure. He then raises the axe up in the air. I begin screaming from the top of my lungs, Leave her alone or I'm calling the cops! As I took my last glance at the woman, I realized that it was the same woman in the photo that Eric sent. That's when the pig man smashes the axe against the woman's skull repeatedly. I practically <coughs> leap up from my chair and begin to vomit. <coughs> This sadistic display was unbearable. What the hell is going on? Someone tell me I'm dreaming. There's, there's no way this is real. I look back on the screen, only to see nothing. Like the whole thing was just a bad dream or a figment of my imagination. What the hell just happened? I know I'm not going crazy. I immediately messaged my classmates in the group chat saying, please tell me you guys saw all that. Did any of you see the pig man? We need to report him. Yeah, I briefly saw him, but then my video chat ended. Same here. That was weird as hell. Must have been a hacker. Thank god my screen went back to normal. Did you see anything, Terrence? I respond as nonchalantly as I can, saying, Yeah, b basically what you guys saw. I, I think it's best that we just put this behind us and move on from here, you know? I didn't know if that was the right decision. I just... I didn't want to further escalate the situation. Acknowledging the pig man's existence was one thing, but going into further detail about afterwards just felt unnecessary. This is the part where I wish the story ends. It's been a year since the incident. I ended up dropping out and taking the semester off due to the mental trauma I endured. I now work at a local retail store. I was coming home from work one day, and I saw an envelope sitting in my mail slot. I open it and discover the most horrifying thing that sends shivers down my spine. It was a picture of my classmate, Cindy. Except, she had no legs and no arms. The picture was titled, Doll Number 21. I remember waking up in a steel cage, locked inside a limitless white room. The room looked like, like it had no end. Just my bed, the cage, and a swarm of distorted figures surrounding me. There were hundreds of them, and they all looked like they were possessed, like something out of the movie The Exorcist. Where the hell am I? This can't be real. I must be dreaming. I couldn't distinguish whether these people were human or not. But all I can say is that I was overwhelmingly frightened by the over-exaggerated mouths of these creatures. They just kept tormenting me like like I was a test subject in a lab experiment gone wrong. Please, stop it. Stop it. What the hell do you want from me? Leave me alone. That's when I closed my eyes and had a nostalgic moment. Almost like I went back in time. I remember opening my eyes and waking up to my bedroom. I can't live like this anymore. My body was dripping with sweat, and my bed sheets were completely drenched. I was honestly convinced that, that I was living in an alternate reality, trapped in a never-ending nightmare. 
taking my prescribed meds really helped with my schizophrenic tendencies, as it would numb down the hallucinations that I experienced on occasion. My parents understood my condition, but my sister Jenny didn't. Me and her never got along growing up, as she would always tease me about my condition. Well, tease me about my other condition. I also have obsessive compulsive disorder, otherwise known as OCD. I had a disorder where I couldn't touch, taste, nor bear the sight of pineapples. I know this sounds quite bizarre, but it's haunted me throughout my existence. It was a compulsion that I had developed at an early age and have grown a great deal of disdain for. The tough segmented skin and the pointy leaves was always something I fathom as to why one could think such a thing was edible. I always thought a pineapple was equivalent to eating a porcupine, just a pointy object that humans have to butcher down to consume. As understanding as my parents were about my condition, I still feel like there was an underlying favoritism towards my sister Jenny. I can tell they enjoyed Jenny's company more, as she was less high maintenance than myself, to say the least. Growing up in the same household as her really made me more uncomfortable than I already was. She would use my condition as fuel for her bullying antics. I remember when I was in school, Jenny would always text me when she arrived to pick me up. The annoying thing was that she intentionally texted the pineapple emoji as opposed to just texting I'm here just to get under my skin. I remember another time where I invited my friend Steven to come over to my place. Hey Jenny, can you order some food for me and Steven? What do you want? Anything but the thing you know I don't like. Please? How about I get you guys a pizza and two drinks? Sound good? Yeah, thanks sis. Dude, is that your sister? Yeah, why? Oh, she's hot. I mean, she's got a lot, a lot of tattoos. Shut up, dude. Stop checking out my sister. Hey, dude, I was just looking at her tattoos. She seems like a pretty cool person. Huh, <laughs> you wouldn't be saying that if you lived with her. Well, I only need to live with her for one night. Ow! I was just joking, sheesh. About 30 minutes later, the pizza guy arrives and delivers the pizza. Here you go, boys. Eat up. I open the box, only to discover a pepperoni pizza topped with pineapples. What the hell is this? Why did you put pineapples on the pizza? Just tell your friend to eat the pineapples, duh. All the other toppings sucked. You suck. I wish you never lived. It's been a couple months since that incident. My hatred for Jenny has unfortunately become far greater as time went on. I was honestly convinced she had a compulsion herself for making my life a living hell. There was this one occasion where the final straw was drawn. I remember watching TV in my bedroom when I see Jenny lurking behind the doorway, holding a sheet of paper. She began waving the paper at me while saying, Hey Jake, I have two surprises I want to show you. It'd be a surprise if you moved out, cause I'd love that. Don't be rude, I have a drawing I made for you. What is it? Jenny then reveals a hand-drawn picture of a pineapple with Spongebob on it. What the hell is wrong with you? Why can't you stop tormenting me? I have one more surprise for you. I got another tattoo. Jenny then lowers the sheet of paper, 
revealing a tattoo of a pineapple on her chest. Surprise! Get the hell out of my room, you freak! I hate her. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. A couple hours passed by, and it was time to go to bed. I couldn't sleep that night, as my blood pressure felt like it was at an all-time high. I could feel my head throb in pain as I became more irritated with the thought of my sister's existence. Why the hell would she get a tattoo of a pineapple? What kind of sister does that to her brother? It was about 1 a.m. in the morning when I ultimately decided to go to Jenny's room and confront her about her derogatory behavior towards me. While approaching her room, I can hear Jenny's voice subtly echo louder in my head saying, Surprise! Over and over again. Surprise! 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 I then open her bedroom door, only to see a pineapple sitting on top of her bed. Is this supposed to be another stupid orchestrated prank? That's when I grabbed a pair of scissors from the top of the nightstand and begin piercing the pineapple over and over again, stabbing and stabbing and stabbing. Good luck sleeping on top of this mess, loser. I could have sworn it was a pineapple. No. No. No, no, no. I didn't do anything. It wasn't me. I decided to close my eyes and recite over and over again in my head. Please be a dream. Please be a dream. Please be a dream. That's when I opened my eyes again, only to see myself back inside a steel cage. I was still in a white room, surrounded by hundreds of distorted creatures. But then my vision started becoming clearer. I realized that I wasn't in a cage. I was in a jail cell. Those distorted figures weren't creatures. They were men in orange jumpsuits. I now remember. I am in jail. For the murder of my sister Jenny. This story happened to me on a Saturday night. It happened when I was with my girlfriend who we'll call Lisa for the sake of the story. I was sitting on my bed watching TV while Lisa was on her laptop working on a school report for her English class. It was due the following Monday which kept her busy on the laptop for the majority of the weekend. 
My parents were out of town, so we had the house to ourselves. I'd just like to point out that Lisa and I were polar opposites from each other. I say this because she was a goth who fantasized over dark and morbid kind of things. I was the complete opposite from that. However, our different personalities didn't stop us from pursuing a relationship with one another, as we'd been together for about four months now. I'd also like to point out that Lisa was extremely socially awkward if she was talking to anyone other than myself. There was a time where I invited her over to a family dinner with my parents. Lisa was understandably a bit shy at first, but as the night progressed, it turned out to be less awkward than I anticipated. Near the end of dinner, my dad asked Lisa, So Lisa, if you could have anything in the world other than Jack, what would it be? Um, I don't know if I feel comfortable answering that. What do you mean? What else would you want other than my son? Harold, stop it! Sweetie, you can tell us only if you want. I could tell Lisa was getting uncomfortable about the impromptu interrogation my parents decided to have by the look on her face. Well, it's complicated. To be honest, I was a little taken back by that statement, as I thought I knew everything about her. I decided to chime in saying, Uh, what do you mean, Lisa? Things took a total 180 when Lisa says, Don't you guys wish you could resurrect your dead loved ones? Uh, sure, I mean, I guess I would. My family found Lisa quite bizarre since that day, but oddly enough, accepted her for who she was. Fast forward to now, and that statement that Lisa made would all make sense to me. Lisa was tired of the monotony of a report, so we decided to head to the balcony. I remember both of us being out of our minds while gazing out into the horizon. Midway through, Lisa offhandedly makes an odd remark saying, it would be pretty cool if I could see Todd again. Todd was Lisa's ex. I found this quite strange that she would say such a thing, considering the fact that we were both dating each other. I assumed she was out of her mind, but sadly that didn't stop me from giving her a piece of my mind. I agitatedly said, Fine, go see him then. It's not like I ever liked you. Lisa then gives me a death stare like she wanted to throw me off the balcony. I stare back at her while I casually take another A long pause of awkward silence occurred, but then I had a nostalgic moment. I remembered Lisa mentioning something about Todd passing away just before we dated. His cause of death was due to undisclosed reasons I won't get into. Everything Lisa was saying all made sense now. She was just expressing that she wanted to see Todd again since he was no longer here with us. I attributed my lack of memory to being s out of my mind, which helped made the mishap more plausible, so I extend my arm to pass the d to Lisa. She then slaps the d out of my hand and aggressively says, He was better than you anyway. I had gotten into arguments with Lisa in the past, but I could tell she was at her boiling point this time. She then storms out of my place and immediately gets into her car. Despite being wrong in the situation, I stupidly shouted from the balcony saying, Fine! Have fun fishing on Tinder, loser! She then flips me the bird and begins driving off into the distance. I eventually head back to my bedroom and continue to watch TV. About five minutes later, I couldn't help but feel guilty about what I did. I then decide to text Lisa saying, Please come back to my house. I'm not trying to fight. I also have a free place and more in case you forgot. A couple minutes go by and I get no reply. That's when I start becoming more anxious. I kept contemplating whether I should call Lisa, but I didn't want to submit to the fact that I was begging for her forgiveness. I continued watching television. That's when I noticed Lisa's laptop sitting on my computer desk. She had stormed off and obviously forgot to take it with her. I noticed that Lisa had left her school report still open on a Word document, so I decided to proofread it, thinking it would be my silly way of apologizing to her. The report was titled, Be With Your Loved Ones, Even When They're Dead. This wasn't that surprising, as I knew the kind of person Lisa was, but it was also disturbing due to the circumstances that had just occurred on the balcony. I skim through the report and find Lisa talking about a relationship. 
and how she wasn't internally happy and needed some sort of closure. I became more and more anxious the further I read into the report. She goes into detail about her past relationship with Todd and how she misses him tremendously. As I skim through more of the report, I come across a part where Lisa talks about being able to reconnect with Todd through a satanic blog she found online. To summarize what she said, it basically insinuated that you would have to go to the last spot where the person died and die the same way. That way you'll be able to reconnect with them in the afterlife. I begin panicking and call Lisa's cell phone. She then picks up the phone and says, What do you want? In a voice full of disdain and hatred. I try to pretend like I knew nothing about the report and say, Please come back. I I'm sorry about everything that happened. I I'm sorry about what I said. There's no coming back from this, Jack. That's when I hear the sound of a train honking from a distance. My heart dropped and I yelled, Lisa, where the hell are you? Where I should have been all along. I could hear the train getting louder and louder, like it was coming with a full head of steam towards her direction. I began shouting, Lisa, get the hell out of there! Lisa, please, I'm sorry! Desperately trying to stop her from what I knew she was about to do. Lisa, I'm sorry, okay? Get the hell out of there! Please! Oh, Lisa, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Lisa, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please come back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was such an awful boyfriend. I'm sorry, Lisa. She then said, See you again, Todd. No! No, Lisa! Oh, Lisa, please, I'm sorry. This is a true story from when I was 18 years old. It still creeps me out just thinking about it. It all started when I was heading home from my friend Jason's house. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. I was walking towards a bus stop to catch the blue night bus that ran during after hours. My friend didn't really reside within a suburban area, he was more or less closer to the downtown region. That meant there were a lot of random weirdos strolling around the streets, which definitely made me a little uncomfortable to say the least. You're uncomfortable, I have to sleep out here. I decided to wait inside the glass shelter of a nearby bus stop as I regretted my decision to take the bus this late at night as opposed to just calling an Uber. I couldn't help but notice the dozens of flyers stuck up on the glass of the shelter. They were scattered everywhere, all varying from different things like job postings, rooms for rent, that kind of thing. There was this one flyer that really caught my attention. It was a picture of an older gentleman doing a peace gesture with his left hand. The title of the posting was called, Easy $300 in One Day, Call Me. I decided to read further into the flyer as the thought of making an easy $300 in one day seemed like a bargain one couldn't refuse. The flyer had a description which read, If you are looking to make a quick $300, then you come to the right place. This job entails the assistance of cleaning slash chores for a period of 12 hours. Call my cell phone in the details provided below if you're interested. Regards, Philippe. I was a part-time college student, so any extra money would have definitely been beneficial to me. I decided to take a plunge at the opportunity, so I took a picture of the flyer as I see a night bus arriving towards my stop. As I boarded the bus, I refrained from calling the job posting as I didn't want to wake the employer up, so I ultimately decided to text the number instead. My text read, Hello, please contact this number as I am interested in the job presented in your flyer. About 10 seconds later after sending the text, I get a call from an unknown number. I assume it was the guy in the job posting, so I answer it. Hello? A man answered back, Hey, you interested in the job? 
uh, is this Philippe from the $300 a day posting? Yes, yes it is. What's your name, kid? I I'm John, sir. How are you? He completely disregards my question and says, You mind coming over right now, kid? Uh, sir, it's kinda late for that. Can we do tomorrow- Kid, listen, listen. I know it's very late at night, but both my wife and grandma are sick, so I could use a helping hand as soon as possible. I felt really uncomfortable knowing this guy was trying to guilt trip me into coming over to his house. Mind you, it was approximately 3 a.m. in the morning, which made the thought of going that much more absurd. I tell him, Sir, if we can arrange this for tomorrow, it would be much more convenient for me. Kid, John, listen. If you come right now, I will pay you double. $600. Take it or leave it. Whether the man was bribing me or not, I unwisely took the bait. I ended up saying, I'm on my way, I'll be there in about a half an hour, while simultaneously getting off the bus to call an Uber. I ended up getting dropped off at the address provided within the flyer and immediately began second guessing my decision. While standing in front of the house, I get a call on my cell phone. It was from an unknown number again. I answer it and say, hello? Hey Johnny, can you see me? Uh, no, sir. Where are you? Look at the window. I'm looking at it, but I don't see you, sir. Look a bit closer. I'm looking dead at you. Uh, where, sir? <laughs> I get startled by a firm grasp on my shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I didn't mean to scare you. I thought you could see my reflection in the window. Anyways, please allow me to show you inside my house. Uh... Thank you, Philippe. You can call me Creep. Creep? Uh, why would I call you Creep? It's a nickname that my mom gave me as a young boy. All my close friends call me that, so I'd appreciate it if you did the same. Uh, okay, Philippe. I mean, Creep. I mean, we are technically friends now, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Very well, then. Let me show you inside, John. We end up going inside, and I can't help but notice the amount of dolls laying around his house. It honestly looked like he was a hoarder that had an obsession over dolls. I decided to ask him, why do you have so many dolls? It's just a collection that I've accumulated from my childhood. Aren't they precious, John? I've built a special bond with these guys. I'll never feel alone again, you know? At this point, I was pretty convinced that the name Creep was actually his biological name due to the creepy vibes he was given off. I see. Well, what exactly does this job entail? Well, for starters, my grandma and wife are unfortunately ill, so I have to take care of them since they're in bed all the time. If you don't mind me asking, what's wrong with them? Well, my grandma has Parkinson's, so she's unable to function without my assistance. My wife sadly got into a tragic car accident after her dance rehearsal. She's pretty much paralyzed in her legs and can't walk, so I now have to take care of her as well. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She was so beautiful before the accident. I'm unbelievably lucky to be with such a beauty like her. We got married and had about a hundred people there. It was the best wedding ever. Sorry if I'm getting carried away. No worries. What would you like me to do for now? You can start by vacuuming the house. Just don't go inside the bedrooms, because that's going to disturb my grandma and wife's sleep. A couple minutes later, I begin vacuuming the hallway upstairs. The bedroom doors were slightly open, so I could vaguely view the inside of it. I remember seeing a glimpse of a woman sleeping on a bed, which I assumed to be his wife. It was unfortunate to see her like that as she was quite beautiful from what I was able to see. I noticed the man was in the other bedroom having a conversation with his grandma, so I continued vacuuming without drawing too much attention towards his direction. Have you been feeling better? Are you okay? The next part of the story is what sends chills down my spine. The man asked me to put the vacuum down and meet his grandma. As I approach the inside of the bedroom, I see a creepy life-sized doll laying on the bed. I unhesitatingly ask him, uh, where's your grandma? John, don't be rude. This is my grandma. I felt my heart fall to my stomach when he said that. 
I honestly wanted to get the hell out of there, but I didn't want to potentially put my life in danger, so I just went along with it and said, N -n nice to meet you. He then said, my grandma thinks you're really handsome and you should come over more often. Uh, sure, I'll definitely come over more often. My grandma wants me to grab her some McDonald's. Why don't you continue vacuuming the place while I do that? Uh, sure, sir. I mean, creep. The man then hands me an envelope and says, Here's your $600. Thanks for being there for us. Uh, yeah, no problem. I then continue vacuuming the hallway as the man exits the house. I need to get the hell out of here. This guy is a psycho. As I dropped the vacuum on the floor, I peeked inside the bedroom of where the man's wife was sleeping. To be honest, I felt really skeptical about leaving her there, so I shouted, Ma'am, is everything okay? Can you hear me? Ma'am, are you okay? Can you hear me? She didn't say anything. She honestly looked like she was heavily sedated off the meds I saw on top of the nightstand. I end up leaving the house and catching an Uber. I eventually make it home and remember the man had gave me the $600 in an envelope. Thank God I made it out of there. At least I made an easy 600 bucks. I open the envelope only to see six pieces of paper. Each piece had a poorly drawn face with $100 written on it. I shouted in anger. What the hell is this? I contemplated on giving the man a piece of my mind, but I honestly didn't want any further conflict with this psycho. Just before heading to bed that night, I got a call from an unknown number. It was quite obvious that it was the creep, so I ignored it and never looked back. It's been a couple months since that creepy experience. I haven't gotten any more calls from that unknown number since. I was strolling around with my phone one day when I got a notification that someone followed me on Instagram. I noticed it was the creep from the avatar picture on his profile. I was pretty freaked out that he was able to track me down since he only knew my first name and we haven't contacted each other since. I noticed he had only one post, so I clicked it. It was a picture of the woman and the creep on the same bed. She looked sedated while wearing a wedding veil. The creep had his arm around her while there were hundreds of dolls surrounding the two. The caption read, The best wedding in audience ever. She was so beautiful before the accident. I'm unbelievably lucky to be with such a beauty like her. We got married and had about a hundred people there. It was the best wedding ever. I live alone in a small house in Canada. And this all happened about six and a half years ago. I opened my front door one morning to go and get some groceries, and found the strangest thing waiting for me outside. Lying on my doorstep was a small USB flash drive. Almost stepped on the damn thing. Who'd put that there, I thought. It was just a generic USB stick. No label or anything. No way to know who it came from. Well, I did what anyone else would do took it inside and plugged it into my PC. The device was full of pictures. In fact, nothing but pictures. Dozens of them. I opened the first one and clicked through them in order. The first few were just shots from around town, general places that I recognized. The fourth image was taken on our town's busiest street. In the image, the street was full of people but there was somebody in it that caught my attention immediately. Me. The image showed me in amongst the crowd, just minding my own business. Well, this was a small town. Was it just a coincidence that I was in the picture? The fifth image had been taken on the same day. Again, it was taken in our town. Again, I was in it. The photographer was closer to me this time. Whoever had taken these pictures of me, I hadn't noticed them at the time. Next came several more pictures of me in various locations around town. Then, something more chilling. A photo of a house. My house. 
It was nighttime in the image, and the living room light was on. I clicked through to the next picture. It was another image of my house, this time taken even closer. Through the living room window, you could see me sitting on the couch, watching television. I could tell from the clothes I was wearing that it had been taken the night before. I had no idea that somebody had been outside watching me. I kept clicking through the images on the drive. Photo after photo of me inside my house, taken from just outside my window. Because it was so light inside and so dark outside, I was totally unable to see that somebody was watching me from out there. I couldn't see them, but they could see me, clear as day. Didn't even need to use the flash on their camera. After twenty or so photos of just me inside my house, there came a real curveball. An image taken from inside my hallway. The man, or woman, or whoever was taking these pictures of me, had been inside my house the night before. There were photos of my living room, now lightless and empty, obviously taken after I'd gone to sleep. Photos of my kitchen, of my dining area, my stairwell, and several taken as the unknown person ascended my stairs towards where I was sleeping. My brain started to run wild with thoughts about who had been following me. Had I wronged someone in the past? Said the wrong thing to the wrong guy? Was this just some weirdo who'd decided to target me? Were they armed when they came to pay me a visit? Whatever the case, somebody had come inside my house at night and taken pictures of all of the rooms, including my bedroom. The second to last photo was of me, fast asleep in my bed, totally oblivious to the person in my home. The final image was just of a handwritten note, framed in close-up. The message on it simply read, Never hide a spare key under your doormat. I've since moved house. This story happened a couple years ago when I was in my early teens. It all started when I went to the movies with my friend Sam to go see the world premiere of The Dark Knight. The movie garnered a lot of notoriety at the time, obviously due to Heath Ledger's leading role as the Joker. I personally thought it was the greatest movie I had ever seen considering I've seen almost every Batman movie that ever existed. I decided to buy some Dark Knight merchandise at the vendor booth located in the theater. What appealed most was how cheap the Batman masks were selling for. I didn't have a Halloween costume picked out for October yet, and neither did my friend Sam. We both collectively purchased one mask each and figured it would make for an easy costume to trick or treat with. I can honestly say it was an astronomical improvement from the cliche bedsheet over the head ghost I was last year. Fast forward to October 31st. Me and Sam both wore our Batman masks and began going door to door, looking for an opportunity to fill our candy sacks faster than any other trick-or-treater on the block. Trick-or-treat! Well, happy Halloween, Batman. I mean, Batman. That's it? Lame. Get the hell off my property, you ungrateful twerps! The majority of the houses were pretty generous, with the exception of a few bad apples, to say the least. On this particular night, there wasn't many houses that had their lights on, which generally meant that they didn't really celebrate Halloween, or in other words, they weren't giving out candy. Me and Sam were understandably upset considering we'd been walking for at least an hour. I continued trick-or-treating while Sam began to head home through the pit located in the middle of the neighborhood. Why didn't I just stay home and watch Spongebob? The pit was just a fancy nickname for the forest reserve which was generally used for nature walks during the day, but me and Sam went there solely for the sake of a shortcut home. I began walking about half a block down when I see more houses without their lights on. Screw this, I'm going home. I eventually approached the pit while beating myself over the head for not leaving at the same time as Sam. As I entered the pit, I instantly had second thoughts of taking the longer route as this route seemed nothing short of irresponsible and dangerous. I ultimately decided to man up and continue walking through the pit as I didn't want to prolong my already dreadful night. 
Why the hell did I have to take this route? I can barely see anything. I knew I should have dressed up as a skateboarder. I would have been home already. I remember the pit being so dark to the point where I could virtually see nothing except for whatever my cell phone light was illuminating. <laughs> what the hell was that? I began walking faster as I could hear faint sounds of what sounded like a maniac clown laughing. <laughs> what the hell? Who's there? Who's there? At this point, I was so petrified, I instinctively dropped my candy due to the adrenaline rush flowing through my body. I couldn't care less about the candy, as I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. <coughs> That's when I saw the source of the laughter standing a few feet in front of me. It was a man dressed as the Joker from the Batman movie I saw previously. He honestly looked like an exact replica of Heath Ledger's with a hint of blood on his costume. What made this more disturbing was how casual his demeanor was. He just stood there smiling at me like my appearance was amusing to him. I didn't want to express the fear I felt internally, so I tried to playfully marvel at his costume and say, Hey there, I, I really like your Joker costume. No matter how hard I tried to keep a composed poker face, my body language and mannerisms couldn't help but show the fear that bled inside of me. He then took a couple steps closer to me as I began to cautiously take a few steps backwards. <laughs> hey man, what the hell do you want from me? <laughs> Why so serious? Happy Halloween. The man surprisingly walks past me while I watch him in complete shock. What the hell was that? Was that some real life joker? At this point, I continued walking home while looking back every two seconds to make sure the man wasn't lurking behind me. I eventually make it home and watch a couple of YouTube videos, trying to forget the creepy encounter that just took place. That's when my dad pops into my room and asks me to answer the house phone. Hey, Mark, answer the house phone. Hello? Hey, Mark. Is Sam still with you? That's when I felt my heart drop to my stomach. Uh, no. He left to go home way before I did. Oh my god, why would you leave without him? He's not even home! Sam's parents end up calling the police, which resulted in an entire block search party. What came of such an innocent Halloween night turned into a nightmare. Sam's remains were eventually found in the pit, with his face lacerated into an exaggerated smile, and his head decapitated from his body. I haven't trick-or-treated since, and I still live with the regret of not leaving at the same time as my friend. I informed law enforcement about the bizarre encounter with the man I saw that night. Call it speculation or whatever you want, but I know the death of my friend Sam had something to do with that sick man. Or should I say, the Joker. are looking for any witnesses to come forward in the connection of a deadly homicide of a teen. The victim's remains were found at the local park observatory. The suspect is described to be approximately six feet tall, Caucasian, and was last seen wearing purple attire with a green vest and tie. Police say the suspect is described to have face paint imitating the Joker from the blockbuster hit The Dark Knight. If anyone has any tips, please contact your local law enforcement and you shall remain anonymous. All right, Karen, back to you. Trick or treat! Well, happy Halloween, Batman. I mean, Batman. That's it? Lame. Get the hell off my property, you ungrateful twerps! So, this story happened to my mum's friend in Korea, about 10 years ago. Every time I hear this story, I still get chills.
My mum's friend lived in an apartment complex in Seoul. She was a stay-at-home mother with a young daughter, and her husband was working during the days. One day, she was coming home from running errands with her daughter, and got onto the elevator in her building. When she got inside the elevator, she noticed there was a man wearing a cap and a yellow raincoat, and he kept his head low, so she couldn't really see his face. She immediately felt really uneasy, and she made her daughter stand by her side, the side farthest away from the man. What made her feel even more uncomfortable was, when she pressed the button for her floor, there was no other lit number. And on top of that, she noticed that he was carrying something wrapped inside newspaper close to his side. Things started to click in my mum's friend's head, and she started to panic and decided to take out her cell phone and pretend she was calling home to her husband, who was obviously really not at home, but at work. She started saying things like, Oh, I'm on the elevator and about to get off. Can you get the door for me? And making it seem like her husband was waiting at home. When the elevator did reach her floor, she quickly got off and grabbed her daughter and started to walk as fast as she could to her apartment. She noticed that the man also got off on her floor and was slowly following her down the hallway. When my mum's friend got to her door, she started banging on it really loudly and shouting, Hey, Yobo, I'm home. Please open the door. Yobo means husband or dear. She was kind of pretending like he was coming to open the door. Upon seeing this, the man in the yellow raincoat started to walk away, back towards the elevator. When he seemed to be far enough away, my mum's friend quickly picked up her daughter and slid open her door's passcode thingy. This is usually how people get into their homes in Korea. And she started to frantically punch in her key code. But the problem was that the buttons would make sounds so that the man knew that no one was going to answer the door for her. And he turned around and started to run back towards her. My mum's friend at this point was practically screaming. And the first thing she did when she opened the door was throw her daughter inside. When she got inside herself, she saw that the man was practically inches away from the door. But she managed to shut it and lock it just before he could wedge his hand or a weapon in through the door. Afterwards, looking through the door's peephole, she saw that the man was walking away, back towards the elevator. Several months pass, and my mum's friend was watching the news, and there was a coverage on the capture of a serial killer named Yu Young Chul, who used to kill a lot of prostitutes. She told my mum that she could never forget the dread she felt when she saw the all too familiar yellow raincoat and the same hat that he was wearing when he was apprehended. The person who submitted this story has included a wiki page on Yu Young Chul, in case anyone was curious. It also details all of his killings. A link to this page can be found in the description below. I will never look at life the same way after what I experienced. It still bothers me just thinking about it. It happened a while ago when I was working as a cashier at Starbucks. I worked part time as there was unfortunately not enough hours available, so moving out of my parents' house wasn't the easiest endeavor to accomplish. My parents always nagged at me for the latter part of the day which always had me stressed out. They would always send subliminal jabs alluding to me moving out. I'll never forget the time my dad confronted me while I was doing laundry. Hey, Jason, can you ask for a raise at work? I can't exactly do that, Dad. I'd probably get fired if I tried that. Well, can't you work somewhere else then? I'm gonna need your room soon because I plan to make it Charlie's room. Charlie was my baby brother. Well, can't Charlie stay in your room a little longer? I said I'm gonna need your room, damn it! 
Well, where the hell am I supposed to stay then? Figure it out! You've had plenty of time now! I've always avoided going home right after work, especially after confrontations like that. I would much rather procrastinate at work after my shift was done just to avoid the inevitable arguments that awaited me. It sounded like a better deal anyway. It'd been a few weeks since the tense clash with my dad. My life had been a little bit more bearable since I started going to this local karaoke bar located down the street from my workplace. I would make it a routine to go there after work just to instill a little more enthusiasm in my already dull life. I was a regular, so I knew all the employees on a first name basis. What you drinking tonight, hot stuff? I'll get the usual, Sally. Wait a minute. It's you again. Jason, right? Yep, me again. Good to see you again, Jason. One order coming right up. Thanks, Sally. I really enjoyed coming here as it was the perfect place for guests to lounge with just a small admission fee. The bar always held live performances from various bands, so there was usually a decent sized crowd always in attendance. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the final performance of the night. Please give it up for the lovely Katie! Falling for you, I can't keep away. Are you listening? I want you to stay. Hey, kid, doesn't she have the prettiest eyes you've ever seen? Uh, yeah, she's definitely a pretty gal. Katie had a lot of diehard fans that would show up to support her. She was really attractive, which made older men look like young teenage boys fanboying over her. I've had the privilege of chatting with Katie after her shows before, but this time I mustered up the courage to ask her out. Hey Katie, it's me again. Who are you? Jason, we met on several occasions after your performances. I'm a big fan of your voice. Thanks Jason, I really appreciate- I think you're the best singer ever and you're really gorgeous. Uh, thank you? I was wondering if we could potentially exchange- Oh, Jason. All you men are alike. I bet you just want to see what I look like without my clothes, right? Uh, no. I mean, yeah. Katie nonchalantly takes my cell phone and begins punching in her contact information. Holy crap, this is actually happening. I must be dreaming. Here you go, Jason. Hope to chat with you more. Definitely, baby. I mean, Kate. I mean, Katie. As I was on my way home, I decided to be ballsy and give Katie a goodnight text. I then noticed she had given me a link to her OnlyFans page as opposed to her phone number. What the hell is this? <sighs> well, at least I might get to see some nudes. I've personally never used an OnlyFans before, but if there was going to be someone's account I was going to check out, it'd be Katie's. I eventually make it home and open up her page on my computer browser. A subscription of 10 bucks a month? Netflix doesn't even charge that much. I unfortunately didn't have the funds to purchase such things, but my curiosity was what put the nail in the coffin. I took out my credit card and shamefully typed in the details on the site. I was now officially subscribed to Katie's OnlyFans account. I began scrolling around, seeing a lot of mature content throughout her page. I can honestly say it wasn't the most regretful decision I ever made, as I got to see a different side of Katie. Or should I say, a different side of my longtime crush. Oh yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Throughout the night, I continued to browse through more of Katie's content till it was time to head to bed. It'd been a couple of weeks since that whole ordeal occurred. I still worked as a cashier at Starbucks and made it a routine to go to the karaoke bar after work. Everything had pretty much been the same except I hadn't seen or heard about Katie since. I couldn't help but feel like I had some sort of role in Katie's sudden disappearance from the bar, so I decided to snoop around her OnlyFans once again. Later that night, I had Katie's OnlyFans open on my computer. The monthly subscription I had paid for previously was still in effect, so I could still view her content. There were five observations I accumulated right off the bat. The first observation was that her status said, active five minutes ago. I assumed she had lost interest in the singing gig and was pursuing the OnlyFans endeavor solely now. The second observation was that she began to wear sunglasses in all her recent photos. Hmm, interesting. 
The third observation was that her photos were being taken in an old wooden cellar, not the aesthetic bedroom that she once previously had. The fourth observation was that all her pre-existing content was deleted. Why the hell would she get rid of everything? The only thing left on Katie's page was three photos of her posing with sunglasses. The last observation was the one that struck me the most. I could tell her recent pictures were being taken by someone due to the shadow presented in the photos. Call me Sherlock Holmes if you will, but I had my suspicions that something just wasn't right. I decided to direct message Katie saying, Hey, it's me Jason from the karaoke bar. I'm not sure if you remember me, but I wanted to know why don't you perform there anymore? About 10 minutes go by and I get no reply. She probably gets a thousand messages. I bet she'll reply to this though. That's when I decided to bribe Katie by sending a convincing message saying, Hey, if I tipped you five bucks, could you send me a video of yourself smiling on camera? About a minute later, I surprisingly got a response from Katie showing a hidden video with an option of unlock for $5. I end up accepting the purchase only to see a video of Katie wearing sunglasses. She just stood in one spot, not saying anything. I then heard a male voice in the background saying, Smile for the camera, you vermin! Katie then involuntarily puts on this bizarre and unnatural smile, almost like she was a cartoon character from a Disney movie. I felt really disturbed from what I was witnessing. I decided to continue the game of charades and say, If I give you five more bucks, could you send me a video of yourself kissing the friend you're with? About five minutes had passed and I got no reply. I honestly thought Katie was done with my pathetic games until I got another message of a hidden video with a $5 price tag on it. I hesitantly unlocked the video, only to see a disturbing clip of Katie saying, He's not my friend! Don't ever say he's my friend, because he's not. He's more than that to me. He's my everything. He's my one and only love. That's my good girl. Oh, yeah. The young boy wanted some kissing action. Let's make his money's worth, shall we? I felt sick to my stomach. I then realized that the gentleman's appearance stood out to me like I recognized him from somewhere. I couldn't exactly pinpoint where I knew him from, but he definitely looked familiar to me. The man then said, I bet you'd love to see Katie's beautiful eyes, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Oh, I'm gonna make this your best five dollars ever spent. <laughs> That's when the man removed the sunglasses from Katie's face, revealing her eye sockets with both eyeballs missing. That's when I exited my web browser and immediately turned off my computer. What the hell was that? That was wrong on so many levels. I decided to head to bed and call it a night, hoping to sleep off the nightmare I just witnessed firsthand. It's been a couple months since the incident had occurred. I haven't seen Katie's OnlyFans account since, as I assume she deleted it. Or should I say, that man in the video did. I haven't told anyone about this, and quite frankly, I don't know what to do. I still go to the karaoke bar with an optimistic attitude that one day I'll see Katie again. <laughs> Falling for you, I can't keep away. Are you listening? I want you to stay before you go. I want you to know that I'm down, down. Hey kid, doesn't she have the prettiest eyes you've ever seen? For you. <laughs> <laughs> this all took place a couple of years back. I was walking my dog through a local park late one night and decided to take a little break on one of the park benches. I sat down and immediately felt something under my butt. It was a USB flash drive which had either been forgotten or abandoned by somebody. I waited around for maybe five minutes to see if somebody would come back and claim it. Nobody did, so I just put it in my pocket. Like I said, 
It was late at night, so the park's lost and found area was closed. I planned to head back there in the morning before work and hand it over. Maybe the owner might come by and collect it. Probably a student who had some work assignments on it, I figured. As I sat at home, my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to take a quick look at what was on the USB. I plugged it into my computer and checked its contents. Strange. There was only one file on the USB. An Excel file, of all things. Some poor schmuck must have lost this thing after its first use. The file was simply titled, Little Black Book. Needless to say, I opened the document. It was just a large collection of names, addresses, and numbers. Mr. X, Tudor Hill Drive, 52,750. Mrs. Y, Springfield Avenue, 47,300. Dr. Z, Deacon Street, 52,200, etc. The list ran on and on, probably 40 or 50 names and addresses in total. At least 25 of them had been highlighted in red. The rest were just in black. Strange. Why would someone go through the trouble of making an Excel file with all this information in it, then saving it onto an empty USB as the only file? Were these someone's clients? Someone's friends? I had no idea. And what were the numbers next to each name supposed to mean? They were all in the same ballpark, between 30 and 60,000. And I decided to dig a little deeper and look up a few of the names and addresses, just to sate my curiosity, you know. I started with a couple of the names in black. It looked like these really were real people and their real addresses. Okay. Still didn't give any indication about what the numbers meant, though. I looked up one of the names in red. Mr. X. That's when things took a darker turn. Mr. X was indeed a real person, and the address listed was indeed his, but he had passed away a few years back under mysterious circumstances. The same was true of Mrs. Y, Dr. Z, and all the other names listed in red on the document. They'd all perished either under mysterious circumstances or through some sort of unfortunate accident. Starting to worry that this USB might have belonged to someone in the clean-up business, so to speak, I began to put the pieces of the puzzle together, and figured I knew what the numbers next to each name meant. There were the amount that the people had been contracted for. This was a hit list. I immediately called up the authorities and handed the USB over to them, telling them where I'd found it and what the information pertained to. They took it from there, and I haven't heard anything else about it since. Had somebody left the USB on the bench intentionally for somebody else to come and collect? Or had it simply fallen out of the owner's pocket? I still don't know. Probably never will. But I'm glad that nobody came by that park bench during those five minutes I waited around. It was dark. The park was completely empty. And the owner or collector really wouldn't have wanted that USB to fall into somebody else's hands. Who knows what they might have done. I've been holding on to this for a couple of years now, and feel like I need to get it off my chest. I had a few years to digest this, and now I'm ready to share my story with the world. I wish to remain anonymous, so for the sake of this story, my name will be Danny. The details of this story remain vivid, but somewhat foggy, as I try to reminisce on the distant memories that occurred a couple of years ago. It all started when me and my parents resided together in an old townhouse which was located in a neighborhood notorious for having a high crime rate. I never liked living there and neither did my parents, but it was the only thing that we could afford at the time. My parents were a little rough around the edges, considering they had both been through a lot in their younger years. My dad has had a few run-ins with the law while my mom lost both her parents at a very young age, so seeing them edgy at times didn't faze me at all. Well, I'm doing my best, alright? Can you do something else? What you're doing isn't working. 
I'd like to see you do better. Well, do better, damn it! Shut the hell up already. I'm tired of hearing you nag all day. You shut up, you bum! Almost every night, I could hear the constant back-and-forth bickering that occurred for hours on end between my parents. They would always fight over what I assumed to be financial-related issues, which had only gotten worse over the years. My parents both didn't really make much money on their respective jobs, so hearing them argue was almost a daily occurrence. I was always scared that things would turn violent, especially with the way these two went at it. I remember one night, I was in my bed trying to induce myself to sleep by watching a couple of YouTube videos on my cell phone. I could hear the usual shouting match coming from the kitchen downstairs. It honestly sounded like they were at the point where they were going to be in a physical altercation. I pressed my ear against my bedroom door and could hear the distant bickering become more hostile between my parents. I could make out my mom saying, If you don't get a real job, I'm taking Danny and we're moving out. What in the hell are you talking about? He doesn't even like you. Shut up! Shut up! Shut the hell up! I remember hearing sounds of my mom opening up the kitchen drawers, which led me to assume she was searching for something sharp and potentially do the unthinkable. That's when I decided to head downstairs and mediate the feud to hopefully put it to rest. As I approached the kitchen, I could see my mom holding a huge knife in an overhand grip, the kind of grip that someone uses in preparation of stabbing someone. I could also see my dad holding one of the dining room chairs, in which I assumed was his defense mechanism. What are you doing here, Danny? Didn't I tell you never to leave your room unless you have to use the washroom? I'm sorry, Mom, but I heard you and- Go to your room, you little turd! Don't call him that! Don't tell me what to do, you mother- Mom, please don't kill Dad! I said go to your room, Danny! Leave Danny alone and put the knife away, Helen! <coughs> That's when my mom began piercing the <coughs> family portrait of us. Except she was only piercing the portion with my dad's face. Mom, stop! Please stop it! It's been a couple weeks after the whole saga had occurred. My parents ended up getting a divorce, which unfortunately left me to reside with my mother. The court unfortunately ruled that my mom would be in favor of getting custody of me due to my dad's criminal history with the law. I honestly contemplated on running away due to how much I dreaded living with her, especially with how toxic and controlling her behavior was. I would spend most of my time locked in my bedroom, sulking on why I couldn't live a normal life like the rest of the younger individuals in my neighborhood. Why in the hell do I have to live with her? Why couldn't I just live with Dad? He was always the better parent. I can't stand her. I wish she were dead. What made this even worse was the fact that I had a curfew during my school days. I didn't even have time to join any after-school clubs or sports teams due to the simple fact that I was too worried about not making it home on time. I remember my mom locked me out of the house for several hours due to the fact that I was five minutes past my curfew. The one thing I found even more aggravating was how my mom permanently banned me from going to the local Chuck E. Cheese restaurant located down the street from my residence. For those that aren't familiar with Chuck E. Cheese, it's a restaurant that has arcade games and playrooms for younger crowds such as myself. I enjoyed going there, as it would bring back fond memories of when me and my dad used to go. I usually went to Chuck E. Cheese every time it was my birthday, just as a tradition my dad established when we all used to live together. But all of that is gone now. My mom took my entire childhood away from me, which I find equivalent to ripping my heart out of my chest. She selfishly didn't want me going because she didn't want me to be reminded of my dad's existence. The rules and restrictions I had to abide by really made it difficult to make any friends, which put me in a dark state of mind for the latter part of my life. 
There was one night where I decided to approach my mom and convince her to bring me to Chuck E. Cheese for my upcoming birthday. I honestly cared more about Chuck E. Cheese than my actual birthday itself, which is why I ended up using it as an excuse to go there. Hey, Mom, can we please go to Chuck E. Cheese for my- No, Danny, I already told you this. But it's for my birthday. No, 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 no. I anticipated the rebuttal my mom was going to throw at me, but that didn't stop me from being persistent with my request. After a few tears and relentless pleading, my mom eventually caved in and agreed to take me there on my birthday. The exhilaration of going to Chuck E. Cheese after all these months was honestly something I would compare to an inmate getting released from jail. I felt so excited, to the point where I didn't even care about anything else. Just me, and the place that I once grew to love. My birthday eventually arrived, and it was time for me to finally visit Chuck E. Cheese once again. It was about the evening time, so the venue was usually packed to full capacity. I couldn't help but marvel at what was in front of me, as I genuinely felt I was a kid in a candy shop. Pinch me. I must be dreaming. I immediately started playing the arcade games while my mom wandered off to grab some food. I remember being so hungry, but at the same time so infatuated with every arcade game that was in front of me. I couldn't help but indulge in countless games as I knew this could be my very last time at Chuck E. Cheese. That's when I felt a strange tap on my shoulder. I turned towards the direction of where I felt the tap, only to see a large Chuck E. Cheese rat mascot hovering over me. I was a little alarmed that the mascot would approach me, considering there were hundreds of guests in attendance. Uh, hey, Chucky. The mascot didn't say anything. He just stood there staring at me with his big elongated eyes. I noticed he had red stains on his costume, which I assumed to be pizza stains. But then I noticed the stains had transferred onto the shoulder area of my shirt from the tap he did earlier. I now knew that these were definitely not pizza stains. They had to be blood stains of some sort. Chucky, is she gone? Yeah, she is. Here. Take my hand, Danny. I missed you, Dad. I missed you too, son.